you hear me yet? Oh, I don't want to yell. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Let them chat a bit. Welcome, welcome. Um, happy Mother's Day to all the women out there. Um, as women, we raise the world. Um, we protect our communities and, you know, we, um, we fight and we bring up that next generation, um, especially the next generation of women leaders. So happy Mother's Day. Much love and blessings to everybody, everyone. <laughs> happy Mother's Day. So um, my name is uh, Bima Dosh Kapukian. Well, I should do it in the right way. So um, I'm just going to stand over here. So Bojo. Oh, come on, you guys. How embarrassing. Montreal. Bojo. Okay, one more time. But you got to really say it. You got to say it from here. Bojo. Okay, awesome. That's so much better. So uh, my name is uh, Bima Dashka. I'm from Saugeen First Nation. And that is in, uh, it's on the eastern shores of Lake Huron. We have the most beautiful sunsets in the entire world. You may come and visit, but you can't stay forever. Uh, <laughs> no, you can come and stay. Uh, so yeah, it's in Bruce County, um, in the Bruce Peninsula. Our sister community is uh, Nea Shingaming, which is Cape Croker. And we sort of protect uh, you know, the peninsula um, and the gateway to um, Manitoulin Island. Uh, so really happy to be here. I'm a professor at Concordia University. I teach in the history department and in First People Studies. Uh, my research is housed at a place called CODES, and that's the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling. If you would like to learn more about my work, you can Google up TVO, and you can Google um, uh, Cultural Revival at Saugeen First Nation, and you'll see me, you'll see my research, I work with very old technology. So I work with wax cylinders. Those are the very first um, audio recording technology invented. Um, and I located wax cylinders uh, in London, Ontario, and they were um, there. They hold the medicine songs and stories of the Anishinaabe people. And it's my pleasure, honor, my blessing in this life to digitize those songs and stories to bring them back home to my community and to work with the elders and the youth and um, really bring that knowledge and put it back into our community and see people live it again. Um, so I'm really proud of my work. Oh, thanks, you guys. Thanks. That's cool. Thanks. Thank you. Miigwech. And yeah, and so the, the person on my recordings, his name is Robert Thompson. His Anishinaabe name is Puwikwinip. And the best way I can explain what his name means is it means repeat. It means to go around again and again and again. And how appropriate that he made these wax cylinders with a gentleman named Dr. Edwin Seaborn. So super cool stuff. Um, definitely very difficult and risky work um, when we're talking about the sacred. Lots of people can be offended by that. And some people even feel like the, I shouldn't you know, um, even be listening to these old recordings. And I really fight against that. Um, the fear of the spiritual side of us, of every single human being, that fear is, is a part of that colonization artifact, right? It's part of that, the church, um, to really take that feeling of power and control over our own lives to remove that from us. And so to bring that back, I try, really try to work hard to address that fear and invite people to um, relearn the spiritual side, reconnect, and do it slowly and with lots of support from elders and traditional knowledge keepers, medicine people, um, song keepers, story keepers. Um, yeah, and just try to get everybody working together as a community, as a team, uh, and moving together um, forward. So I can talk forever. I was telling Eden that I'm, when I lecture, and I, have, I see my student here, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I lecture, I could talk for about four hours straight, nobody gets a bathroom break, and then everybody leaves like, ugh. I need a broom to come and sweep me off stage. But I'm so glad to be here because I'm sitting here with my um, heroes, this, right, you all know Thompson Highway. Um, so happy that you're here. Welcome, welcome to Montreal and Eden Robinson. Um, yeah, and welcome to you too. <laughs> bushu, bushu. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited to be here. And like I said, I've been, um, read up on, on their books, but even in my own course, um, I rely heavily, heavily on um, Eden Robinson's work. So over the pandemic, it's been really hard on people. 
and reading has been incredibly difficult to slow the mind, to calm ourselves. Um, it's been difficult. And so a part of what I was trying to help my students through is still to get them to engage with story, even though we're under these really stressful and difficult times. Um, but we had to look at the video series, um, the Trickster series. So awesome, and of course, lots of encouragement for students to go and, and to buy the books, of course. And next semester, when we get back into the real swing of things, they will be purchasing books. Because uh, <laughs> that's important, buy those books. Um, yeah, so it was really, I really liked the series, I, and, but of course I read the book before. And then it wasn't enough, right? When the, when the next books came out, I went on them again, on them again. Um, and so I've just always, mesmerized, I guess, by the way, you know, Eden puts the words together, creates the picture in my mind. And I hope that someday I can write like that and make beautiful pictures in other people's minds. And then as well, I've been reading lots on Tom, of Thompson's, um, which I've written two of them at the same time. So one that will become a book in my course moving forward is From Oral to Written, fabulous compilation of stories from indigenous writers but also um, permanent astonishment. And it's so incredible to read that story. It was funny. Um, I appreciate the definitions around half-breed and Métis, very helpful in identity politics. And now I have something published I can rely on. Uh, so thank you, Thompson. Oh, he's gonna fall asleep on me because I talk too much. Okay, so um, I better ask, hurry up and ask a question. Okay, so one I'm gonna ask about, because I'm, I write as well and I need some help um, or at least advice, and I had a list of questions in my pocket and I can't find them because my bum's too big. So I'm gonna stop digging and I'll have to go from the top of my head. So, but what I wanna know about, I guess first, is about the writing process. Mm -hmm. So one thing I really struggled with in writing my dissertation was maintaining sort of the same outlook, the same perspective day after day in writing. So some days I'd be in a really shitty mood and I would write really ugly, bad and, and negative. But if I was in a good mood, it was really beautiful and, and, and flowing. And I just was wondering, how do you maintain that in your writing every day um, without getting sidetracked by life? I know you weren't <laughs> listening. I'll ask Eden first. I have to keep my, I keep my eyes closed as much as I can. I'm not sleeping. I had a, a high, an eye injury. Uh, a you've heard about it. It's called detached retina. A lot of people, more and more people are getting it because of computer screens, they say. We spend too much time looking at the computer screens, uh, especially writers and, uh, and tax lawyers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> those all those tiny little figures because you make so, 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 so little money, right? The, 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 the poorer you are, the, the harder they have to look at the screen, which is where, this is where you get this detached right now. And I had to have eye surgery. Oh my God, have you ever had eye surgery? Where they put a needle into your eyeball and they cut open the little tiny section, and then they have to stitch it closed afterwards. Oh my God, how do you do that is remarkable. So part of the healing process, and I'm healing nicely, is that I should try to, I should try to rest my eyes as much as I can, mm. which is why I'm sitting here with my eyes closed and listening to her beautiful voice. I can hear it a lot, my ears are working well. well. But uh, anyway, that's, I'm, I'm healing right now, so I can't look at you as much as I like you. So I have to, I, I'll have to, the, the downside of this experience is that I'm gonna have to deprive myself a good portion of your beauty. <laughs> well, that's why you'll, you'll see me with my eyes closed sometimes, the time, from time to time. And I hope you never get this condition. It doesn't hurt, it's just very inconvenient. Yeah. Anyway, we're not here to talk about detached retina. No, here to talk. You're asking <laughs> you a know question. what? When I was a kid, I know Thompson from when I was young, and he's friends with my mom. And so when I was young, Thompson used to say, I was born in a snowbank. And I say, yeah, right, God, this guy likes to tell lies. I want to meet his mom. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I'm from, I'm from the extreme north of Manitoba. I'm, from, I'm an Arctic creature. I know I look like a tropical creature, but I'm not. <laughs> Unfortunately, two people tell me I look Brazilian. When I'm in Brazil, people mistake me for a Brazilian. Anyway, I, I have the same swarthy complexion that Brazilians have, right? Don't Brazilians have swarthy complexions? No. <laughs> Beautiful. They look like chocolates. Uh, caramel. 
They have caramel complexions. Oh, it's cocoa, that's the other one. Um, anyway, uh, so they think I'm Brazilian when I'm there. Really, they ask me for directions on, in Rio de Janeiro <laughs> on the street. My goodness. Anyway, uh, it's just that I come from the north, and there we, in the, uh, the north, the far north of Canada, is, is a place that most Canadians don't know anything about. They've never seen it. Most Canadians know only a tiny slice of the, 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 the like that lies along the American border. And anything further north than that, most Canadians have never seen. And I highly recommend that you go. One of the reasons why you can't go up there is it's fiercely, fiercely expensive mm -hmm. to go north. From here to Iwayevik, which is the, la the last village of the Quebec Arctic across from Iqaluit, oh, it's a pretty place. Icebergs and polar bears and seals and Inuit people, and <laughs> <laughs> which you can't trust. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love them very much. <laughs> some of my best friends are some of my best friends are Inuit. <laughs> Men, you some of my worst enemies are Inuit too. So that kind of evens out the evens out the picture. But I'm from the north, and there back then when I was born, and this is really dates me. I had to expose my age. I was born in the 1950s, and uh, then there was no hospitals up there, no schools, no electricity. It, people lived off the land with their bare hands, and so. And we were nomads following, forever following the caribou. And, uh, and that's what we lived on, and so on and so forth. We were nomads, uh, traveling in dark sleds in the wintertime and in canoes, paddle canoes in, in, the winter, in the summertime because there were no motors. And uh, the land up there, fortunately, is uh, huge, Im unimaginably immense, uh, and uh, unimaginably beautiful, which is why I'm sorry that most of you have probably never seen it. It's inaccessible to people who are not from there. And uh, did you know, for instance, that Nunavut alone is just the same size land mass as all of Western Europe? Yeah, and yet Western Europe now has a population nearing half a billion, whereas Nunavut has a population of only 37,000. Yeah. So you can imagine the emptiness and the vastness. So back then, everybody, everybody was born in snowbanks. It was part of the culture. <laughs> It was part of the culture. Yeah. We lived in tents, and we traveled across the north, and women were pregnant, and, they, and when, they had to give, when they went into labor, like my mother did, <gasps> by the way, today's Mother's Day. <gasps> <gasps> you have to call your mother today. <laughs> even, if she's, even if she's no longer here, call her. <laughs> you can email them these days, you know? <laughs> you can text them. <laughs> oh, yeah, mothers are so important. Don't you think mothers are important? See, for instance, without my mother, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but everybody was born in snowbanks. But it was normal. Like further north of us, people were born in houses made of ice. They called igloos. P kids, babies were born in those houses. We're we're northerners. We're born with thick skin, you know. And that's that's so that's as true a story as you will ever see. <laughs> and, the, and that's and the reason people don't are shocked by that story that a baby can't be born in snowbank. The truth of the matter is that. Welcome to our culture. It's, that's <laughs> the way it was back then, and, and it's no, it long, long, long ago. That, that way of living stopped in 1960, when I was already uh, eight years old. And like, when the government put it, the federal government put it in place a program whereby nat uh, native women, uh, pregnant women, were flo at the end, and when their time came, were flown down to a hospital in the south, whereas the Palm Manitoba is south. Uh, and they were put up in a hospice for a week or whatever, and they'd give birth in a hospital. So for after 1960, everybody was born in a hospital. Pre-1960, almost everybody was born in snowbanks. And that's God's truth. <laughs> no, I, I do recall um, it being like a, there was a situation where a family from, like you're talking about from the north who were flying down for medical care in the south, and they carried their baby in it. I'm going to say it's a tikkanogan, but I just don't know the words for the language of the people up there. It's a cradle board. So they had the baby in the cradle board. And because of the um, lack of knowledge, I guess, around culture, the security put the tikkanogan through the scanner. The baby went through the scanner. Oh. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Like this kind well, of crap. Yeah. Like, the, again, right? When, and so uh, you're right, like, about people having to fly south to get health care. But again, that cultural divide, it, it impacts people's lives and their health, and, and for <coughs> egg, it can do it forever. And mm -hmm. so I'm really glad you're here, and I'm glad you tell those stories, because we need to know in the South. Well, that's, that, we that's, that's one of the reasons why people like here. me are writing, so that the world will know that we've had, uh, contrary to what, what we see in the media, the, 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 the mainstream media, 
like the picture you have, people have, people have of me is that I'm, I'm, it's negative. You know, I'm a loser, I'm a drunk, I'm a suicide, suicidal, blah, 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 all that stuff. Would you get so tired of hearing that banged over the head, over the head of this, that information constantly? Because that's the reason why I wrote the, the, the last book, for instance, it's called Permanent Astonishment. It's a memoir. And the reason I wrote that book is because contrary to what the media tells the world about us, we had spectacular lives. Mm -hmm. I personally have had a, a better life, a more one of the most spectacular childhoods ever in the history of childhood mm -hmm. in this paradise that is called Northern Canada, which I hope one day you will see. Oh, I was going to say that Ivoyevic, a plane ticket from Ivoyevic to from Montreal to Ivoyevic uh, on the northern tip of Quebec, which is worth seeing, $3,000 for one person, return. Ouch. Yeah, and that's just Ivoyevic, never mind Ikalawit and Pond Inlet and, and on and on and on. $4,000, I think somebody told me, for a plane ticket from, from Toronto to Pond Inlet. We had to, we had, we don't others had to live with ex travel expenses like that. And, uh, and you just took it for granted. To me, it was just water under the bridge. I just mm -hmm. did it. When somebody got sick, you're, I was living in Toronto at the time, you just, rushed home, and you didn't, it didn't matter if it cost you $4,000 for that plane ticket, but you were there by your father's bedside as he, was, as he lay there dying, and, uh, and you never thought about the money for a second, you know? Love is much more important than money, and, uh, and that's just the way it was. You know, people uh, uh, just, we just had a very, we, we have, people have a tendency to judge the North with Southern eyes. You know, Southern Eyes, which sounds like a country song. Uh, southern Eyes. Uh, <laughs> uh, or maybe I'll write the song. Maybe right after this, I'll scroll it up in the dressing room back there. Anyway, uh, uh, you, look, you look at me with Southern you Listen to this. This is the country song. The lyrics are coming. You look at me with Southern Eyes when I'm a, nor when I'm a Northern boy. You know? <laughs> it's coming. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a songwriter, okay? I, that's how I, part, I make part of my living. And... Uh, but yeah, the, we didn't grow up in, in uh, suburban comfort. We didn't grow, see when I, we had to get a lake because there was no running water. When I was a little boy, five, six years old, I had to go down the hill with my mother on laundry day and get ice from the lake. There was a hole in the ice that my father chopped and we'd get, get water, bend over, put the pail on the ice and then take it up the hill. We lived on a hill at this several times, there were several hills. and. Then brought it up and remember, put it in the tub that was sitting on the stove so we could heat it up. Heat up, make we had to make our own hot water. We had to heat it up and boil it on this on this great big cast iron stove. And then my mother would transfer the water to a tub, a wash tub, and then she would scrub the clothes on a scrub board all day long because that's how long it took to wa to do all your children's and husband's clothing. And uh, so when I went to re res one of those residential schools, notorious residential schools, I, I was one of those. I went to one for nine years. And, uh, and I loved it. And you know why I loved it? Because I could actually just have to, I didn't have to go down the lake to the water in 50 below weather to get the water. I could just turn the tap. And I got hot water right there. And for me, that was a miracle. Mm. It was a miracle for anybody from up north where the nearest school is 600 kilometers south of us in Brochet, Manitoba, for to, to see Kids in the south, in Montreal, Winnipeg, and Vancouver, taking 10 minutes to walk down the street to the nearest public school, taking 45 minutes to walk across the neighborhood to go to the nearest high school, to take 45 minutes out of their lives to get on a city bus and ride across the city to the nearest university, and very fine universities there were too. University of Winnipeg, the, most, which was the one nearest to us, was a, one of the most respected universities in Canada. To have that kind of access to education was a miracle for us. We didn't have that access. For us to go to school, we had to leave home. And people don't know that. They think we just walked down the street to the nearest public school. It wasn't like that at all. You would, if you had lived in those kind of circumstances, you too would have to put your six-year-old boy on a, on a bush plane to send them to school for 10 months of the year. It was just the way it was. And we rolled with the punches. And obviously I survived because I'm still here. Looking awfully good. Don't they look good for somebody who's been, th who's been through hell? <laughs> so, uh, supposedly I went through hell, but I haven't. I'm having a great time. I'm having a great time with my life, as you can see. Yeah. What else? Let's talk about the Sasquatch. <laughs> yes, let's talk about the Sasquatch. Oh, no, no, This no. moment is from Sasquatch Quentin. Did you know that? I was also born. You were what? I was also born 
In a snowstorm. In a snowstorm? Yeah. Oh, tell us about <laughs> it, please. Tell us about it. Really? Are you serious? I'm serious. Oh, tell us about it. I'm serious. Uh, mom started having contractions, so her and dad hopped in the truck. And Mama O hopped in the truck with them with a pair of scissors. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> exactly. Oh, the things people went through yeah, to, to see uh, oh, the, the stories about being born up there. It's mm -hmm. We're northern people, okay? She's a northerner. We have extraordinary st stories to tell, and the time has come for us to talk about the north and the reality of the north and to invite you people to come up north, you know? Start with easy destinations like Ivoyevic, if you have $6,000 in your pocket to take you and your partner. So, and there's jobs to be had up there too, teaching, teaching schools, nursing, medicine, doctors. P we need people like you, brilliant people like yourself, beautiful people like yourself to come up north and, and, and help us survive the transition, this fantastic transition that we're, we're in. Uh, like I've gone through about 500 years worth of history in my lifetime, and I've had to go jump s s certain hoops that other people haven't had to. Mm -hmm. But what a pleasure it's been, you know? As Terry Fox once famously said, it's not supposed to be easy. Mm -hmm. And I put humbly in brackets, if it's easy, it's probably not worth doing. You know, the, ha the, more, the harder the climb, the more, the more arduous the climb, the more exciting it is, the more dramatic it is, and the more spectacular the vista it is you get when you get to the top. And that's the kind of life I have. I'm climbing to the vista, and I'm gonna get there soon. Mm. So you were born? <laughs> 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 so, were you there? <laughs> were you, so you were born? Were, were you there? Were you, were, you, were you there for the conception? <laughs> I, 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 almost, I almost missed mine. <laughs> <laughs> I got there almost late for the conception. <laughs> <laughs> That's because we didn't have taxis or ambulances where I come from. We had to, I had to run. There's a legend about that, about babies being dropped in the sky. You have that legend too? Yeah. Dropped in the sky by the Greek spirit, and they run through the bushes naked. And there's this, uh, I, if we have time, I'll tell you that story. It's a <laughs> wonderful story. And then they uh, arrive at their mother's side for the birth. Along the way, they meet several animals. And one of my favorites was they meet the bear. Maybe you have that, that's when you meet the Sasquatch, <laughs> OK? <laughs> I, love the sa I love Sasquatch stories. Uh, that's why I kind of look like a Sasquatch. <laughs> if, I, if you look at me this way, I kind of look like one, don't I? The reason behind that is because my, father, my mother's from inside Manitoba, just on the border. And my father's from just inside Saskatchewan. And in the old days, of course, the Sasquatch lived in Saskatchewan, d'accord? And uh, <laughs> then he was chased away by the white people when he got there, which is where he ended up in BC. <laughs> and that's a true story. <laughs> but anyway, the baby ran into a bear, about woke up a bear who was hibernating. And uh, which, of course, is what white, white people do when they sleep, right? You guys hibernate too, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> for, for eight hours at a stretch, anyway. <laughs> See, you never think of that as hibernating, but it is. That's what you do. That's what you'd be doing tonight. You're gonna hibernate <laughs> like a bear. <laughs> anyway, uh, the last uh, the last creature that he met along the way was a bear. He woke him up from his sleep, and the bear was so pissed off at being woken up his hibernation that he kicked him in the bum. And and to this very day, uh, this is true. I'm not gonna show it to you, but uh, actually, it fades after a while. But all native babies are born with a blue spot on their bum. <laughs> For some reason, they're bruised. And they say that it comes from the bear's kick. So when we were babies, we all had blue spots. And you can tell what a native baby is by looking at their, at their bum. Unfortunately, it fades at a certain point. <laughs> so I can't show it to you. My <laughs> left, <laughs> I'd love to show you my bum. But the, you, won't see, you won't see much. <laughs> You only got, you just gave me a vision of uh, a dry lips. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the opening scene where she leans over and kisses him on the bum. Right. Oh, Gary Farmer was hilarious uh, in that. Gee, that's actually the kiss from dry lips sort of came, sort of came from that story. My, my play dry lips out of the cafe, which hasn't been seen here in Montreal yet because it's very shocking. Bring it back, yo. <laughs> and, uh, but it begins with a kiss. Uh, the trickster, who is a woman, because there's no gender in, in our languages, right? You can be a man or you can be a woman, spiritually speaking. And, you're, and, and some women here are probably men, spiritually, and some men here are probably women, spiritually. That's how it works, the lack of gender in a language. And, uh, but the trickster is sort of, uh, oh yeah, there's a naked, the, the lights come over, there's a naked man on, on the, there's a naked man on the screen. 
And of course, we all like looking at naked men, don't we? <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this man <laughs> is sleeping on his front. So you see his bum loud and clear. In fact, that spotlight comes up on the bum. And then it enlarges and enlarges. And then you see, and then there's a sexy stripper type of music coming out of a harmonica, a jazz harmonica. Uh, live, played live in the, in the sound room, uh, uh, behind the audience, of uh, Carlos Del Honco, best harmonica player in Canada. Uh, and then you see this woman's leg coming out of the darkness, naked. And she, uh, she puts on a, a nylon stocking, like Anne Bancroft in The Graduate. <laughs> I'm not an actor, but that's the one scene I can do really well. I could put on a, a, a silk stocking like Ed Bancroft. <laughs> I have actually nice legs, you see. I, also, I have a nice, just like my bum. Wow, you know, I was just born in a snow bag. What can you say? <laughs> anyway, uh, and then she leans over and kisses the bum. And uh, well, there leaves a great big lipstick mark on his bum, naked bum. And, that's, and then the play starts. And her boy is in trouble for that kiss. Because it's not his wife, right? And that's how the drama, that's where the trouble begins. And, uh, and then, oh my goodness. Then, it's, anyways, that's where, I get, that's where I get the scene was from the birth of the babies in our culture. That is so, yeah. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I, I just, as you talk, I just keep thinking about, and sorry, Eden, I'm not ignoring you at all, but, um, but when you're talking about the North and explaining stuff to, like explaining the differences in the North compared to the South. I remember reading, and this is years ago now, like at least five or six years ago, and I don't recall exactly where I read it, but it was you, your writing. And you had said that you remembered the introduction of TV in the North and how that had a detrimental effect on the language. Yep, oh, absolutely. TV arri when did TV arrive in Kinemats? She's from a, ta a town called Kinemats, which I find. Yeah, I've never been there. In the mid-60s. But it's, sm it's a small town, right? Yeah. That's why I call it Itty Bitty Kitty Mat. That's where she's from. <laughs> Itty Bitty Kitty Mat BC. <laughs> oh, I love it. Anyway, but you have TV in Itty Bitty Kitty Mat, do you not? We had, we had the first color TV in 1965. Were you born yet at that time? Uh, I was born three years later. Three, three years later? Yeah. Oh, so there was television when you were born. See, I, there was no television when I was born. Uh, it, the first television arrived in 19... Oh, electricity arrived in our, in our community in 1973. Mm -hmm. I was 21 that summer. Ah. And uh, so, uh, and that's when the language started fading. It was very obvious. Eh? Mm -hmm. The laughter st started fading because Cree is the funniest language on earth. Bar none. And, uh, and the la laughter decreased and so did the, the, the language. And now we're very serious, because we're speaking English. <laughs> and we, and you pump, and we pump French too, because we have a lot of French people. There are a lot of French people in the country, but in the country, there is a quartier that is called Saint Boniface, etc. And uh, so, uh, TV, uh, yeah, that's where it started. Yeah, and so TV changed the world. Eh? Mm -hmm. It really did yeah. up north. All that stuff that I'm talking about, where babies being born up north, all that intense, all that's gone because of TV. Yeah, it was, yeah, I remember dad telling me stories about, um, like, there were all these very respected elders, and he'd be telling me about the affairs they used to have. And I said, oh? And he's like, yeah, we didn't have TV. Oh. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Are you pretty still alive? Hmm? Is, your, is your mother still alive? Uh, my mother's still alive, Dad. <gasps> oh, have, to, have you called her? Pardon? Today, have you called her today? It's oh, Mother's Day. Oh, I can't day. call her today because she's on BC time, and she doesn't wake until 10. Today, actually, she's three hours behind schedule. Yeah, she. if I phone her before 10... She, she was fun. You must have called her tonight. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll call her uh, this afternoon before her shows come on. Mm. <laughs> 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 so, so if I call her, uh, there's a World War II documentary on tonight that she watches. And then uh, my sister got her Netflix. Mm -hmm. So she's watching a lot of telenovelas. Mm -hmm. So after the World War II documentary, she's going to watch a telenovela. She's on the second season of Senorita Hacienda. I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's five seasons and there's 36 episodes per season. Yeah, so she's, she's really, really into it right now. And I 
don't want to spoil things for her because the, the main character dies in like season three. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, dad, uh, dad was multilingual. Uh, he spoke uh, three different native languages, uh, Chinook and English. Hmm? Um, so he was always very frustrated with me uh, because uh, I learned English first, and English is all up here, yep. and the highest light is all here, mm -hmm. uh, and there's different sentence constructions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, <laughs> it's a very punny language. It's very quick. So when you're learning, it's, it's really easy to say something uh, wrong. <laughs> so buhwala and buhwala. Mm -hmm. uh, to speak and to fart. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> pee -pee? Um, and the word for please sit down is very close to please give me a lap dance. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, we're the same thing, dude. <laughs> they're hysterical. The translations are un more, a lot of creeds untranslatable because it's just, it has too much to do with pleasure. Mm -hmm. hey? mm -hmm. Like, uh, you really notice that about the European languages, how you how they're, uh, they're, 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 they're afraid of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And the reason behind that, because in our trickster culture, I've, I've studied this for many, many years, is that the extraordinary story of eviction from the Garden of Eden is unique to, Europe, to European languages. Uh, it, that, does, that story does not exist in our mythology. No. So that theoretically, we're, we're still in the garden. To us, Canada is the most stunning garden, the most beautiful garden on the face of the earth. And I can tell you that because I've seen 63 countries so far. And it's, it's just, we live, a, we live in a garden. I mean, you have to. I mean, you look at the trees outside, you know, and, and your heart starts to sing. Well, I'm from Kitimat, so I live in a very wet garden. <laughs> yeah, very, very wet, where you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, so, yeah, yeah, that must be, I, I don't know about like that. I, I'm not crazy uh, about It rain. only rains 300 days out of the year. Yeah. How much? 300. Oh, a year. A year. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a lot of rain. You know what I noticed about going to your home area? Mm -hmm. uh, once I took a boat from Fort Hardy, Vancouver Island, which is not another trip worth taking. Mm -hmm. The northern tip of it, fly to Vancouver, let's take the ferry across to Nanaimo, and then up go to the northern tip of British Columbia. There's a boat, a place called Port Hardy. I took the boat, there's a boat that goes up what they call the Inside Passage. Mm -hmm up the coast, to the islands and all that, all the way up to Prince Rupert. And uh, it takes three, I think it took three nights. Does it take overnight? It's just overnight, eh? It's overnight, but if you go to Haida Gwaii, it's another night. Yeah, and then you can move on to Haida Gwaii, and then you can even go up to Alaska by boat as well, to Ketchikan, catch, to catch eh? Ketchikan, yeah. Alaska. And uh, it's one of the most sun stunning boat rides you will ever see. And you really should go there as soon as you can. Because some of you look like you're not going to be, you're not bound for the shares very long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't go this year. I'm not going to specify, go gonna specify which one. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to excuse me, I can't really see you. So, so with this, with this, this, this eye vision I have at the moment, everybody, everybody looks twice as old as you. There's this hazy texture to your, to your, to your appearance. That's why you look so what. Other than that, I'm sure you're well-preserved. I'm sure you are. Yeah? Aren't they well, don't they look well-preserved? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I wonder why. Eh? <laughs> oh, but don't go this year. BC Ferries is having a lot of issues with uh, uh, the staff getting COVID and canceling ferry, ferry trips at the last minute. So go next year. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Just love that, that, that trip. It's actually the drive from Prince Rupert to Terrace is just one of the prettiest drives in Canada. That's about two and a half hours, eh? Yeah. I looked at I looked up on the internet. Yeah, it's it's right it's right al uh, it's right along the ocean for a third of it. So you have the spectacular coastal mountains mm -hmm. yep. and you know, you have the trains and you have all the wildlife and it's it's just super pretty. Yep. Um and yeah, no, I have the the ferry up to Alaska. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been on that one too. Yeah, which one to Ketchikan? Yeah. Oh, you've done that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you have. You're oh. the kind of woman who does everything <laughs> after all. <laughs> she's, she's that kind of woman. 
<laughs> well, their their fairies were a little a little more utilitarian. Like I was, I got spoiled on BC fairies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the 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 night, you know, the day rooms and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. No, my mom's from Bella Bella, so we take the ferry from Prince Rupert yep. to, to Bella Bella like at least once a year. So I'm hoping to bring her in September for her birthday. Uh, she's she's missing her home. Our language, talking about your language, our language too is hysterically, hysterically. From the first syllable you utter, you start to laugh automatically. Mm. Uh, really, uh, I'll say something as simple as the ni. That's the most common word in Cree, by the way. You, you heard it here <laughs> and there. <laughs> and the more shocking the story you're telling me, the longer the ni. Really. And there always, you also have that with, uh, like, uh, when you're telling me, uh, when I'm telling you a story, and the further back it is in the past, the longer the, the second syllable. Okay, so if, if, it, if it happened yesterday, oh. if, you know, if, uh, uh, or last week, you say, kayas. Okay? And then if you're talking about something that happened at 15 years ago, you say, kayas. <laughs> but, if, but if you're talking about something that happened 100 years ago, you go, kayas! <laughs> <laughs> oh, then we laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh just because we just said it long ago, <laughs> which doesn't make you laugh in English at all. So, okay, another example is knee. <laughs> we say knee all the time. It means good grief. Oh, go on, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it, it can even mean, let's like, cover our expression of uh, disbelief. Mm -hmm. And you can mean holy. Well, you see, in English, I'm not allowed to use words like that because it's inside the garden. If I'm going to walk in, step, take one foot into the garden of Eden, <laughs> oh my God, the garden of Eden. <laughs> You're in the garden of the garden? <laughs> You were named after the garden? <laughs> <laughs> I was named after the garden. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Which is ironic because I have a brown Doesn't thumb. she look like a garden? <laughs> there's something, there's something garden-like about your personality. It's very lush and full of spirit <laughs> and energy and all that. But anyway, ni, uh, oh yeah, like, uh, I would say, like if I say the, the word in English, you'll, you'll, you'll jerk. The, the body automatically does that. The way languages affect hum the movement of uh, human body, the human body, which is why it's so important that people become multilingual, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Not just bilingual, but multilingual. To see how the, uh, uh, each language affects the movement of the human body. And with, the, uh, with this word I'm about to say, you will jerk. I, I was, I'll tell you right now. If not physically, something inside your, your spirit would do that. But ni, among all the other expressions, ni means, means holy shit. <laughs> okay, see, I'm not, I, was, I shouldn't have said that. That's forbidden in English, but not in our language. We say it all the time. And we laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh as a result. And uh, anyway, uh, so we have words like uh, when we saw articles at the store that we had never seen before. Like, uh, <clears throat> what can I say that's polite? <laughs> but I can't, because they're not, none of them are polite. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, okay, for instance, we saw, when we saw uh, 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 prunes for the first time. You know what we call, what do you, how do you, what do you say, how do you say prunes in your language? Uh, it's the same word for raisins, but we add big. <laughs> big, yeah, big. big for bacon? Big raisins. Is that really that? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I say, uh, we say, uh, we call them Xitno Tasnim, which means Xitno is an old man, mm. and Otasnim, uh, a sine is a rock. One piaka sine needs a siniak, okay? Uh, which is why you heard of a village up there called Mississini in northern Quebec, that means mm. big rock. Uh, and so a sine, but, that, but a sine is also our term for testicles. And uh, just like you, you have different meanings for the word balls. In, 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 in English, you have a, a balls are balls. <laughs> <by it. laughs> and they're also, but they can also be testicles. And uh, it depends on the context, eh? And uh, so, Ksitno Tasnima means old man's balls. <laughs> That's our word for prunes. <laughs> And it just goes on, which is why when you're in a group of in a group setting with an eight people, as talking, the laughter is universal and it's constant. We will say, "Pitigui" means uh, come in. The one, the one, 
ne piti piti wana ne piti wewa piti wana wa piti wewa we come in I, we come in you come you come in they come in and kapipiti uh, wit means coming in the door I want to go to kapipiti wit means who is coming in the door and he of course means holy shit who's coming in the door <laughs> it's, it's a big shocker because maybe it's the police because we're smoking drugs or something illegal like that. And we'll go, nee. There's, there's a rap on the door, right? And we go, nee. I want to go with the to I really laugh and laugh and laugh because it's hysterical. I'll say the same thing in English, okay? Hey, who just came in the door? See, let's, let's listen to the silence. It's, that's the way it works. Uh, brilliant. Don't make mistakes. Don't make, make, make me, what am I saying? Don't mistake me. English is a brilliant language, but it, it's a language of the intellect. It's brilliant up here. It's just the, the most brilliant language that ever existed when it comes to mathematics, physics, chemistry, and money. Oh, when I want to regard money, I speak English really fast. <laughs> 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 what, do what do you speak? What do you speak when you want to make money, Reading? <laughs> Which language do you speak when you want to make money? <laughs> that one thing you don't do is you don't go back to Heisla. And I certainly don't I speak, I don't speak Cree when I want to make money, because I certainly make nothing, not a penny, when I speak Cree. But I laughter, that's our genius. And that's, and, the, and you have to go back to the trickster and the personality of the trickster, who he, she is, person, she's by gender. And it's, he's a clown, the universal, the cosmic clown, he's being called. And every native nation in North America has him, her. And she's the cosmic clown and the great speed, let's put it, let's, let's get it right, let's get down to, let's get down to brass straps. I mean, uh, brass tacks. <laughs> <laughs> we, want to, we don't want to go to the brass, the brass straps. They're too much fun. <laughs> Especially if you ping them, I go, snap. And, the, and, the, and whoever is wearing the brass, the brass straps, ah! It squeals with pleasure. It squirms with pleasure. Too much fun. Too much, too, much, too much time in the Garden of Eden, we had to get out. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's the way it works. We, uh, the cosmic clown, yeah. God, we put it, cut him to the chase. The Great Spirit put a clown on the earth, on the planet Earth, not, to, not so we can feel sorry for ourselves, not so we can be guilty of a crime that we never committed, original sin, the idea of a snake talking to a woman and not to, the, the question I have for that snake is, why don't you talk to the man instead? And the only explanation I can get for that so far is because he was smarter than the woman. And you can read that yourself in the Bible every time you read it, um, which, is, which is not true. That's not the truth. Most of the time, the man, the woman is smarter than the man. Okay? Let's, let's face the music here. Anyway, uh, the trickster, uh, so we don't, we're, not here to be, we're not here to suffer. We're not here to be guilty. We're here to have a good time. We're here to laugh. And the trickster, the God, the Great Spirit put tricks on the earth to teach us that l the reason for existence on the planet Earth is to laugh. And that's what the literature that's coming out of our pens as we speak in English, French, and other languages, European languages, is here to say that we can't forget that, that this is a garden, that we must preserve it, and that and one of the ways we're going to preserve it is with laughter. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting too serious. <laughs> too, say some, say some, tell us a good story, a funny story. <laughs> the, 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 tell us about the last time you tried to hold a potlatch. Remember that time? When you got thrown in jail? Because <laughs> it was illegal to throw potlatches, eh? It's just, well, tell them what, what is a potlatch? Tell us. Uh, most people don't know what a potlatch is. You know, somebody, one time somebody told me I was going to BC for a reading. I was going to Naimo, actually. That college, what's it called? Mm -hmm. uh, whatever they co it's called, it's the college. Anyway, I was invited to speak, and somebody, one of the assistants to the director said, oh yeah, they're gonna have the potlatch for you when you get there. And I was just absolutely amazed. Aww. Somebody, they're gonna throw a potlatch for Humble little me. A potlatch <laughs> is a very, very important cultural event in the, in her among her people. That doesn't exist in ours, because mostly because we, didn't, we don't have pots where I come above. <laughs> <laughs> Not back when the when the part of when the white people arrived. <laughs> anyway, uh, but and then it got it's a spiritual ceremony, a gift giving ceremony, and but it was criminalized by the government at a certain point in its history, and uh, you could go to jail for holding a potlatch. Mm. 
right? People went to jail. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where she. Uh, that's where I saw her the first time I met her. She was in jail. We're holding up our hands. <laughs> Remember that time? 99.9% true. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, tell us what, a, tell us what a pot, I, I still don't quite, I've never been to a potluck. So you had to describe, describe it to me. Oh, well, I, this is, oh, there we go. Uh, I've been to many potlatches. Um, if, if you, uh, I grew up in potlatch culture, mm -hmm. uh, both my mother and my father's family's potlatch. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually don't understand fully cultures outside of the potlatch culture. Like I don't understand Sundance culture. I don't understand like, you know. Uh, it amazed me that there were different kinds of Christians. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the the people who potlatch are on the West Coast uh, from Alaska down to Washington. And um, there's a huge break. Uh, the northern potlatchers potlatch very different from the southern potlatchers. So my dad is uh, is Haisla, and uh, my mom is Halfuk. So he's from the north and she's from the south. Um, and the <laughs> uh, potlatch culture is very hierarchical. So there's you're born into your station. Um, I, I had a, my potlatch name given to me when I was 10 years old at someone's settlement feast. And uh, when you get your, your potlatch name, that means you're old enough to attend potlatches respectfully. Uh, and I did not understand the politics behind uh, being adopted into my father's clan. Um, until <laughs> I was much older. Uh, so I didn't understand how patient my mother was being with my aunts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from what I remember, uh, we were called up like halfway through the potlatch and there was a line of little kids and we were all given names. Uh, uh, mine is we will tala, which means big lady. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister's my sister got the name uh, Sigidamana, which is um, sent back chief lady. And the tradition is after the potlatch, you go to the people who gave you the name, and uh, you learn about your rights and responsibilities and the history of the name. So you prove your rank by knowing the stories, the dances, and the songs that come with it. If you don't know them, you haven't earned your name, and you can have that name taken back, which is brutal. It happens very rarely. <laughs> uh, people think that the chiefs are the apex of our system, but uh, the matriarchs really run things. Like if you see like someone getting their name taken back, it's us you've usually pissed off the aunties. Um, so we went to Mamao and asked her what our names meant. And Sika Damanach is a love story. Um, the uh, Hai's the chief, married a woman from up the line. And it was an arranged marriage for political purposes. And they fell deeply in love. Uh, and his other five wives hated her and kept trying to poison her. <laughs> So to, to keep her safe, uh, he sent her back home. Um, but he couldn't, he couldn't divorce her without bringing shame to her or, or her family, so he made her a chief. Um, so so that it's, it has amazing songs with, you know, with like women crying and singing as they comb their, lar their dark, lustrous hair by the river. Uh, and it was just, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful story that I can't really do justice to in, in English, but, uh, and I went, wow, um, what's the story behind my name? And she went, big lady. <laughs> <laughs> so I had story envy of my sister's name. <laughs>
<laughs> we have um, a name like that. Really? In, in my community. Well, for the Anishinaabe, yeah. So it's Chikwe. And the woman that had that name in my community, she's a medicine woman. And she was a big woman, but she was very, very powerful. And so big could describe her in many, many ways. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, the the high chief ladies are, are the big ladies. But I, I wanted, like, well, <laughs> um, mom is 12 years younger than dad. So he was 33 when they got married, and she was 18, I believe. Is, that, is my math right? Something like that. So the, uh, he, my grandmother had arranged a marriage for him because he was an embarrassing 30-year-old bachelor. <laughs> so, you know, so as soon as he heard that she was arranging a marriage, he took off fishing uh, and then met my mother. <laughs> Shacked up with her for six months, <laughs> and then they got married, and then he brought her home. Uh, so our our fam, um, you know, my, his sisters had words with him. Um, uh, you know, they didn't think she was old enough uh, that he needed someone, you know, more his age. And so, mom had words with them. <laughs> So the name that they gave her so that she could attend the Palaches was Sea Monster Turning the Other Way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Holy smokes. That's a very good story. <laughs> um, you know, we'll just keep talking, but if anybody has any questions... Um, if you guys want to wave at me, I'll be happy to come over and hand you the mic, and you can ask. There's yeah, two so mics. I, I just want to say one more thing uh, before we start the question and answer period, and that I was invited to the potlatch in Nanaimo, and uh, when I got there, I was feeling so important because I, I need to understand the very important events. And I got there, and the, the, the coordinator was native, but the, the assistant coordinator was not native, mm -hmm. and she misunderstood her instructions, and apparently they had planned a potluck for me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so, I was so disappointed. <laughs> Just an ordinary <laughs> Just an ordinary so, that, so that's the closest I've ever come to going to a potluck. Uh, well, they had, a, they had like a like a potluck for me when I was the writer in residence at UNBC. Hmm. And I was introduced to moose sausages. <laughs> 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 and they were amazing. <laughs> And then I had elk burgers, and it was like, holy crap. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> these, 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 are, these are amazing. And so, you so, know. you know, you guys, both of you, sorry, I start to slip into my slang street talk, but both of you received awards this, this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've both received many, many awards. <laughs> Does your own communities recognize you? Do they... No, they, I'm just uh, an ordinary, when I go there, I don't speak English, uh, I go to it twice a year, non-pandemic times, and I, and I, sp I sp if you, even if somebody talks to me in English, I answer in Cree, and uh, I'm just an ordinary Joe Blow, I don't, I'm not, I, I just love, I, do, I make people laugh, I, I crack a lot of jokes. And uh, that's what I feel. But there was a woman here who wanted, I was asking a question. Let's go to her. Yes, let's go to... She said, no way, Jose. <laughs> there was a woman? No, there's nobody there. Oh. <laughs> well, well I, in that darkness and with these eyes, I can't, I can't distinguish. Oh, she's going to come down, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm close enough. Oh, oh okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm big, a big fan of both of you. Uh, and what I love is your sense of humor, actually. And, um, uh, okay, so I do have a question. <laughs> Be before that, there is something I, wanna, I want to comment on, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if I should call you Mr. Highway. It sounds, Thompson, what do you prefer? Tell, tell, her, tell him a what? Should I call so you? Would you prefer Mr. Highway or Thompson? It doesn't matter. Thompson, what, what was the question? I haven't she got there yet. She didn't get to it yet. So my question it's coming. is it's coming. for you, <laughs> but you had said something about English and 
or Western languages, European languages, and the Garden of Eden, which I thought was really interesting, yeah. except that it's in the Old Testament, so it's not just European languages. Yeah, no, it goes beyond. It goes beyond. Yeah, I found yeah. that. It, it, I want to it's know. More, it's more universal. It's just that I was just keeping the context with the Canadian, yeah. with French and English. Yeah. So I want to know, are there languages, or were, uh, what in your languages, both of you, is taboo then? Because there must be, or are there, no taboos. We? Oui. Taboo. So what are you not allowed? Taboo. Like, so you asked her to talk about the potlatch, and she didn't do it. Um, so see, <laughs> see what she did? So that's that, her saying to him, nice try, you. buddy. Ain't Can happening. You answer that? Oh, that's, that's my way of being. Uh, we're, um, you know, we're not really supposed to go there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, with with outsiders, not just you know white people, but with people who aren't Heisla. So I I tend to skirt around it. <laughs> and I mean, you know, people don't. There's there's a lot of um, information that you know. There's there's conversations that we're having about how we share our culture. Um, and it's very, it's, this is just specific to the highs law. It's not, it's not universal. It's, uh, it's a specific set of circumstances where we, um, you know, we have a history with people who've uh, written about us in ways that were weaponized. So, um, you know, when I first started writing, my aunties were very clear about um, the things that they wanted outsiders to know. Um, so we had, so when I started writing Monkey Beach, I had a lot of these uncomfortable discussions. <laughs> uh, and if you know the Heisla, uh, we're very blunt, um, uh, especially the Robinsons. Uh, so the, you know, one of my aunties, started the conversation with, um, uh, do you think of your culture as performative or do you live it? And I was like, live it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but out of those conversations, uh, you know, I, I learned so much. And it was such a privilege. And there, there are things that I would like to share, but you know, we're we're cut, we're healing, and we're trying to work through these things. Uh, most potlatch cultures are consensus building, um, so it, it takes a lot of consultation and a lot of meetings and a lot of hashing things out. Uh, sometimes we do that on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, it's just, you know, uh, I'm back in my dad's community. Uh, I live two blocks from my mom's place. And um, uh, the other things uh, that we don't talk about are witches and bad magic. So that was an interesting conversation to have when I started writing Son of a Trickster. Um, Mostly because they didn't want to pull bad energy on myself. So they said that I had to approach it in a good way and explain uh, to the ancestors what I, what I was trying to do. So, um, yes, there's, I, I've really started to appreciate um, my elders. And it's, it's scary to think that I might be an elder. <laughs> It's a pretty heavy responsibility, and I'm uh, a little intimidated by it. Do you? Is there anything that is taboo for? I I emailed you. Remember when we first started talking? I emailed you both, and I said, "Is there anything you don't want me to talk about on stage?" And you're like, "Oh no, just don't talk about Sasquatch." So when you brought it up, I'm like, "You told me not to say anything." <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. I but it creased, did it crease have joke, a life? I, I joke all the time. It's very hard to get a serious word out of me at, at the rest of times. 
But did, did the Nehi? It was a joke. Nahi, huh? Did the decrees? Do they have a line you cannot cross? We're not talking about this, and if you do, you're gonna get it. Is there that line? <laughs> well, it kind of. What do you call that? Karma. Uh, well, there's there's no set rules. We just don't. We just don't talk about like somebody uh, got divorced, for instance. You know, and we'll say. Uh, <clears throat> That means that means you you see you you see the couples in there together except they're not together anymore they're separated they're divorced uh, you say hmm. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> we, we growl like a dog sometimes you, if you shut your mouth and you say knee and you go hmm. you sound like you're growling like a dog and uh, I'll do it for you but only for you <laughs> hmm. okay. <laughs> See, you're laughing already. <laughs> like you said, I, haven't said, I haven't even said a word yet. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll say to the to the divorce couple, we'll say, hmm. That's just a bit of my kite which you give it, you give it pin tweak, which means, uh, so is it true? Good grief. Is it true what they say about you that you threw each other into the garbage? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the word for divorce and grief. <laughs> You only <laughs> threw each other away. <laughs> I mean, and the implication being into the garbage, right? And so you say that you're not supposed to talk about divorce in front of the divorced couple. Mm. But if we say that, we, the, the tension is burst, but the, but the burst of laughter, destroyed or whatever, eliminated by the burst of laughter. Mm. And before you know it, they're married again. Which so which only gives us which only gives them another chance to throw each other into the garbage <laughs> some other time. <laughs> but now they do. Don't you know some people who should throw into throw each other into the garbage? Um, oh yes I do. <laughs> <laughs> don't we do don't we all, eh? Don't we all. Oh, uh, but then there are those couples where you just thought they would always stay together and when they do get divorced, like even though you're not in the family or you're not even, you know, a part of that circle, it's still devastating to see that happen. Yeah. Um, and I always um, mentioned to my friends and to my sister who have been <laughs> married a long, long time that that's a pretty amazing feat. That is, takes a lot of strength, something I can't do. I've been single for 15 years and I'm never changing. Um, <laughs> yeah, And I have three sons that I raised by myself. Uh, yeah, but it just, you know, it's, it's cool. Not for me. Um, but yeah, right on to everybody. But yeah, divorce is really sad. I didn't even really laugh. <laughs> and then, and then the, but the woman does, the woman, except the woman does, she just stands there with cr looking cross eyed. And, the, and there's my mom, who was a very funny woman, and a very tiny woman, and a very lively woman. She did behind my, that's, that was my aunt, but her, her, her husband had just died, or whatever. And, and my, no, her grandson had just died. And, and my brother said, Where is Kevin? And Sorry and to interrupt. Behind, you, yeah, you, you should. My mother. You should use you, you, your micro. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the, hus the, the husband the husband died. No, the the grandson of this woman died. My aunt, and my mother, who was his sister-in-law, is behind her. Who was she was shorter than my aunt, and she was behind her going. This is how you do. This is how we do it in Cree, Okay. So one way or the other, you burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> about death, you know? <laughs> anyway. I have the aunt that when she has to talk about the sensitive stuff in the family, she'll whisper it. Those are always funny because then we have the older aunts who can't hear and they go, <laughs> what? <laughs> who died? Like, Nobody died. <laughs> uh. One time I took a, uh, what Adrian, Adrian Clarkson uh, uh, came home with me, which is an adventure, a whole story in itself. I'd love to tell it someday. But <clears throat> we were staying at this house. I put them up at this house, kind of a hotel. And my cousin was, was, was had, had been hired to cook. She's very good at campfire cooking. It's her specialty. Because we were going to take the Adrian collection out into, into the forest and leave her there. <laughs> 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 oh, she liked that. 
did you hear? Did you, did you, did you hear that robust laughter <laughs> bursting out of her esophagus? <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, anyway, um, and I said to Dorothy, my my cousin, everybody on this in this community is my cousin. Oh, it's a crazy place. Anyway, um, she, I said, and I said, oh my God, Dorothy, I said you said your sister robbed the bank. Adrian Clark, she, it just burst out of me. <laughs> and this is going to be Adrian's cook, right? <laughs> and, she's, and this is Adrian and the both were perfectly made up with her lipstick. And her hair is like just poofy and wonderful and fluffy, <laughs> all that stuff. Perfectly made up, perfectly put put together, and uh, and she's going because <laughs> 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 she's used to that. Have you ever seen her on TV? Or who hasn't in Canada? When she when she, when somebody is being interviewed, and everyone's camera pans over to her face, and she's going, <laughs> etc. When you, when you actually shoot that sequence, you're actually just, just doing the interview. You're just doing the monologue. But in the editing room, they edit to Adrian's face. And, bef and, uh, and, bef and uh, the last thing we do at the shooting is for Adrian to do what she calls her guppies. And she goes, and the guppies, she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and splice them into the documentary. And it looks wonderful. She looks like she's reacting to everything. And she is. She's a very good reactor. <laughs> <laughs> she's a very good reactor. She blows everything she sees. Anyway, uh, yeah, Dorothy was uh, Dorothy was in the kitchen behind Adrian going. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we'd say, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. Oh. It's a good practice to make, yeah. to, to adopt. Try it yourself sometime in your home, in your own home. <laughs> so oh. you'll, uh, trust me, your audience will laugh. Well, our our traditional stories were like pretty raunchy. She's what? Pretty raunchy. Like Go Adrian? Oh <laughs> uh, you didn't know? <laughs> who was raunchy? Who was raunchy? <laughs> our traditional stories. <laughs> oh they are they are raunchy. Yeah. Oh my god, those are raunchy. Oh my god. Oh I you, see you, 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 you can't trust them in the name. I'm having trouble with that right now. With the book I'm writing right now, my editor is really, really biting it, like yeah. really resisting. So we're doing the back and forth right now as to how much I, she can include in there. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. right now I'm, I'm arguing yeah. about the fact that there's a there's a farting story in there. The trickster farts a lot. Uh, there's yeah. a reason why she's so anal, and uh, there's all <laughs> and all that. No, uh, unanal, the opposite of anal. Uh, and I said, to, finally, I said, well, I have to get this story in there, otherwise the book, the chapter won't make sense. So I said, okay, listen to her, okay. I finally burst out on the email saying, "Listen, there's a there's a disease that if we if you think that, that the disease called diabetes is stalking our community, and people are dropping off left, right, and center because of this disease, well, so is yours. Our our disease is called diabetes. Yours is called colon cancer, because you, and the reason why colon cancer has taken such a powerful grip of your community is because you don't fight enough. <laughs> and that was my argument, because I had no choice. So I can hang on to that story. Awesome. And I'll be seeing that, 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 that draft, the new draft of the, uh, her critique to, uh, the day after tomorrow, and then I have to do the final draft. So we'll see. This is very borderline here, whether the book ends with a fight or not. Oh. oh my gosh, I can't well, wait. What's, what's this new one called? Huh? What's your new book called? Oh, uh, well, I was told by somebody that you're not supposed to uh, say things like that. And that's one thing you don't talk about <laughs> <laughs> in our culture. Yeah, I'm scared. I'm scared. <laughs> they, say, they say you're jinxing. You know, the publishing house will die or, or somebody else is burned down. Or, and, yeah. you know, and you get your writers are superstitious people. And uh, I, I, it's so hard to publish, get things published, yeah. that you're scared that anything can happen. Your editor might develop colon cancer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, oh dear, the story so we have about colon cancer. Um, uh, even the word rectum in Cree is funny. It's it's, it's your laughing already. We say, we say, kiputsim. Kiputsim is a rectum. I'm sorry to say this, but we had to go into the garden very shortly, just a few seconds, okay? I promise <laughs> I'll bring you back out. Uh, but kiputsim, which rhymes with chickaboom. Huh? 
Uh, I can't change it. Very, very thank you. So it's, it's we're getting a new book from you in the next year. And yeah. you too. Uh, well, I'm still farting around with a bunch of different books. The top, the, the top contender is the trashy band Council Romance. Ooh, I love <laughs> it. it. So, sorry, yes. Sorry, yeah? oh, I missed that. A trashy band council romance. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that sounds hot. That sounds hot. The, it sounds the, hot. The, the traditional <laughs> name for the place where Kitimat Village is is Timoza, which means snag beach. <laughs> Now that yeah. sounds like an awesome <laughs> title for a book. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be a roaring success. Anyway, I've gotten to, I get so tired of, readers get so tired of asking, me asked that question. So what are you working on now? What are you working on now? So I started making up my own titles just to evade the question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, people have been getting tired of my, my I have a tendency to uh, use really long titles, mm -hmm. like Dry Lips Out of Milky Campus Casing, and, and Ernestine's Use Rope Gets Her Trout. And uh, the <clears throat> another piece that I wrote was called uh, I, I, t I put my head in the little skunk's hole, and the little skunk said, take it out. Okay, <laughs> that one didn't go very far, which is why you never heard about it. Uh, maybe that was one of the reasons why I never went far, because the title was too long. Anyway, um, and I make up stories like this. So now I've taken to writing for titles with very, very short titles. Like my most recent play is called The Bitch. Okay? <laughs> And it was such a big success that they had to follow up with a sequel, and the, and the, and the, name of the, the title of the sequel is called The Slut. <laughs> And I'm looking for the, 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 the it's going to be a, a male actor, by the way, who's going to play the slut. Okay? So I'm looking for a male actor out there. If anybody knows a, if any male actor out there who wants to be a slut, give me a call. <laughs> oh, well, the one, yeah, I wish I had a story to go with it, but it's, uh, don't panic, there's plenty of bannock. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, we have that too. Don't bannock, no, don't panic, it's only bannock, as you say. <laughs> I was wondering if the last page of um, The Return of the Trickster, mm -hmm. that very last, last page, if that was a hint about what you might be writing next. Oh, no, that was where I was going to go with the fourth book, but after the third book, it just stopped. Like, uh, I know when I'm done with a book, if I wake up and I'm not thinking about it, and I go to sleep and I'm not thinking about it. So that was actually a really sad time. Like I woke up and I didn't think about Jared. I was like, oh, it's done. Oh, okay. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed living in that world. Um, but I think it's time for the trashy band council room. <laughs> I think so too. Ooh, I'm dying. I can't wait. Okay, That's, I think I talked way too long. Did I? Oh, you guys are so mean. Okay, I'm sorry to cut you guys off. I talked too much and then I should have you know how we end, we end our, our public uh, speaking uh, uh, sessions in my culture? Yes. We, we're Catholic. Okay. I know I don't look like, I know I look like a Protestant, but I'm actually a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> These days you can't really tell the difference. <laughs> anyway, we usually end our, 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 our sessions with uh, thanks to the Metropolitan uh, Blue, what's it called? The Blue, the Metropolitan, Blue, Blue, Metropolis, Blue, Metropolis, Blue Metropolis Festival for organizing this extraordinary event. You must have worked so hard putting it together, pieces together. It looks complicated. I've done, I've organized festivals, I've produced festivals. I know how much work it is. But anyway, to thank them for inviting us to this beautiful mm -hmm. place and this beautiful city and all that. But we usually end our sessions with Hail Mary, a Hail Mary. A very quick Hail Mary, because we see, we, my part of the world is country, Catholic country and, and they have, they have the, that's where you hear the fastest Hail Marys in the world. And I'll give you an example. Can I give you an example? 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 Can I That's a Hail Mary. And that's how we end your chances. Thank you. Fabulous. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Lip, lip, lip readers are forever going blind coming up to my territory to try to read our lips because <laughs> we talk so fast.